I've been a collector of TV signal boosters and UHF converters for over 20 years now. I wanted to collect something TV related since video has been the focus of my whole work career. I remember a booster being on top of our TV set when I was a child and they're cheap and they're small. So that's what I decided to collect. They represent an aspect of the material history of early television that I think is overlooked. They're humble items, but like seashells, there's lots of variety. I now have 120 some different boosters, which I think represents about 80% of all the models that were made, at least of the tunable set-top variety. UHF converters were a natural addition, and I now have over 160 of those, which I think represents about 70% of all the models. It's probably too many, but almost all of the photos in this presentation are of models from my collection. So why did boosters exist in the first place? They are a product of their times, which was the early years of post-war television. The map shows the location of all the U.S. TV stations on the air in June of 1948. 30 stations in 19 cities. Here, the colors represent 25, 50, and 100-mile diameters, the prime, secondary, and fringe coverage area of those stations. The um, receivers in the prime areas needed only a simple antenna, maybe rabbit ears. Secondary, they needed a larger outside antenna, and fringe coverage required a large high antenna. So you can see not much of the U.S. had good or indeed any television reception. The result was an awful lot of people had lots of video noise, that is, snow. What was worse, there were already problems with co-channel and adjacent channel interference in several cities. So in September of 1948, the FCC ordered a freeze on all new TV station applications so they could work out a new channel assignment plan. The 80 or so applications that were already in the works could go on the air and did. That freeze lasted into 1953. But the number of TV sets continued to skyrocket from 250,000 to 28 million during the freeze. TV was increasingly popular. Lots of people wanted TV reception, but many were far from the transmitters. The signals were often weak, which meant a snowy picture, even with a large high antenna. Something else was needed. Boosters are signal amplifiers, which increase those weak signals and so remove snow and improve the contrast. Most of those early sets didn't have AGC either, so it made it harder. The internal noise of most boosters was lower than that of many early TV tuners as well. Additionally, their tuning methods could reduce interference. So this is why boosters became popular. Boosters were used in some of the very first electronic television installations. Almost none of the pre-war television sets had RF amplifiers, so knowledgeable technicians would build them for their fringe area customers. This one was found by the late Chuck Azzolina in a 1939 RCA TRK-12 set. It got its power from the TV chassis. The 6AC7 was about the best mainstream RF tube of its time. Boosters used several different tuning technologies, and most of these were different from the circuits in the TV tuners. But they were all simple LC circuits sized for the VHF frequencies. Permeability tuning 
changes the coil's inductance by moving a powdered iron rod in and out of the core. Variable capacitors had to be made carefully to manage those highest frequencies, about 200 megahertz. Variable inductors, such as the Mallory induct tuner, mostly relied on movable taps, but they were the only tuning types that allowed continuous coverage over all TV frequencies from 54 to 216 megahertz. Click stop or channelized tuning is what most TV sets use, selecting individual tuned circuits for each channel. Permeability eventually became the most common type of booster tuning, mostly because of ease of manufacture. Very early boosters were mostly capacitor tuned. And as for gain, 6AK5 pentodes were employed in many of the early boosters for simplicity and stability. After about 1951, 6J6 or other dual triodes were preferred, mostly for their lower gain. Booster makers advertised gain of from about 6 to about 30 dB, but noise fa factor numbers were almost never mentioned. Here's a representative sample of four very early boosters. All of these have channel one in their tuning range. The FCC deleted channel one in June of 1948. So now I'll go into a little detail on each of these. Hams will probably recognize this Millen 92101 as the R9er or Q5er preamp. It was designed for hams in 1947. Plug-in coils for the TV channels were quickly made available. But the industrial styling, the coax antenna connectors, and lack of a power supply meant that this was a product for the techie TV owner. Two separate capacitors tuned both the input and the output of the 6AK5. The peaking control just changed the game. Bud was a maker of metal boxes and cabinets and small electronic accessories. The TAB99 circuit is much like the Millen's, but it tunes all the low band channels, one through six, much more convenient than plug-in coils. Later models added a switch and components for the upper channels, seven through 13. You can see the tuning capacitor here and also the selenium rectifier it was almost universally used to power just about all boosters. The MTB-13 was the first booster from the Mark Simpson company. Masco was a maker of commercial audio and PA systems. Note the lack of any channel markings on the tuning dial. This model was also rebranded by Allied Radio and Lafayette. It had, however, the distinction of being rated not acceptable by Consumer Reports in 1948. Its chassis was connected to one side of the power line like the cheap ACDC radio. The mounting screw heads were exposed, causing a shock hazard. Masco fixed that by painting the screws and then changing the model number to MTB13X. I think the Anchor Radio Company was probably run by engineers. Almost alone among the booster manufacturers, they advertised gain and bandwidth figures for their products, and they defended their design choices in brochures. The cabinet was very heavy, so it wouldn't move around on your TV set, and the bottom was covered with a thick felt pad to avoid scratches. That leatherette cover on the outside of the metal cabinet is an interesting design choice too. Anchor was an early adopter of permeability tuning. The rubber friction wheel on the tuning shaft moved the tuning slugs in and out horizontally in the chassis. It's the tuning shaft and the little rubber wheel moves this thing back and forth and that pushes cores in and out of the the coils, the uh, 
little wire pointers here are the dial indicators, and they move back and forth along with the uh, with this whole assembly. Now, like radios before them, boosters came in all sorts of cabinet materials and styles. I got this breakdown from an inventory of my collection. The metal boxes are the majority, and that's probably because most of these small companies were started by engineers, and engineers are pretty uh, happy uh, making things with uh, metal boxes. And they were very available, and you can paint them anything you want, but mostly they were painted brown. Wood was nearly as common, and since it was used commonly for uh, TV sets and radios, it was easy to come by and fairly inexpensive also. Bakelite, that required much more uh, material and uh, it required heavy molding equipment and uh, things like that. So it was pretty much confined to the larger companies that could afford all that upfront cost. And plastics that weren't Bakelite were still pretty new in the early 1950s. So the weren't so many adopters of that, but it was a less expensive option for those who could uh, afford the, uh, the upfront costs. All the pictures, by the way, that I'm uh, going to show you are all from units that are in my collection. Okay, if it's not in my collection, it'll have a uh, an attribution from where I got it. So the booster manufacturing business matured quickly and styling and variety became very important. These two 1950 Astatic models use the same chassis. It's a Mallory and duct tuner, which gives them continuous coverage from channel two through 13, including FM radio and the hand two meter band. Takes quite a few turns of the dial to... Uh, to run through the uh, entire range. This curvy plastic cabinet in the BTU-2 is very striking. First time I saw one of those, I was really taken aback. It's uh, sort of an art deco quality and a little reminder of the, of the May West Emerson radio of the late 30s. Uh, very, very handsome, and when you turn it on, the little dial, little dot there above the dial glows red and sort of illuminates the entire uh, cabinet uh, from the inside, so it sort of has a nice red glow. It's a decimeter, set its large two-stage boosters apart with several styling and performance features. First of all, it's two stages, so it had two amplifiers right after each other. Featured click-stop tuning and a projection display for the uh, channel numbers. Not a complicated one, but there it was. It's un you know, unusual. Also had a choice of wood cabin colors, mahogany and blonde. Blonde wood was a a uh, popular thing in the early 50s. But the click stop tuning in this meant 48 coils that had to be adjusted in production to make them all track. So the decimeters were expensive. The cost was almost $60 list in 1952, which is about $630 today. Philco was the only major TV maker to produce boosters. They repurposed their 1940 Transitone PT25 radio cabinet for their Model TV3. It was available in the natural brown Bakelite or painted a cream color. It used a similar friction drive as the anchor boosters. David Bogan Company, all of these, was another of the audio-related companies that made boosters. 
They enticed buyers with three different cabinet styles around the same permeability tuned circuit. The BB1 is metal, BB2 wood, and the BB1A is plastic. And over their production life, several years, they also had a variety of different colored knobs, different colored cabinets, and decoration. So they uh, gave plenty of opportunity for uh, people to uh, get what they wanted. The Bogan up here in the top corner, the BB-1, is the one that I remembered from when I was a child, sitting on top of our TV set. Um, I went out, you know, one of the first ones I was looking for, but it took me quite a while to find this one. And I think I think I found the wooden one first, which surprised me because I'd never seen a wooden one before. Now, some booster uh, buyers wanted control, and some of them wanted simplicity. These two slant front models illustrate those two approaches. The AT1 has controls for both of its two series connected amplifiers plus a gain control. It was very popular. It sold from 1949 to 1954, which I think is the longest running booster model. The single stage AB from Alliance gained its permeability tuning with a band switch and an on-off function, all in one knob. The cabinet was from their HIR antenna rotator controller. Another continuous tuning booster is the Sonic 107. They use their own variable inductor tuning rather than the Mallory induct tuning. Notice that they did not solve the problem of the high channels getting squeezed into only about 15% of the dial. This is, it used a, a pair of silver-plated coils that were rotated by a set of gears. And a little moving wheel, tap wheel changed the inductance. It was pretty, but it was complicated. Apparently, McMurdo Silver bought Sonic Industries in about 1952. Speaking of whom, Silver made its own click stop booster. Like a TV set, there are a lot of coils to adjust in production. This booster is unusual in that it has a bandwidth control as well as gain and fine tune. Vision Research, Vision Research Labs was a little company on Long Island that produced a lot of models from early 1948 to about 1950. It was a family portrait, most of them. It was a prolific and inventive little outfit. The Commander up here was their last product, as far as I can tell. Uh, model numbers are shown here below. Commander is a very recent addition to my collection. I did not even know of its existence. It has no, there are no advertisements that I've ever seen for it. And it just showed up on eBay, mislabeled, I believe. And I figured out what it was. And I had to work pretty hard to, uh, to get it because it, you know, it went on and off. Um, eBay, and I have no idea what, what happened there, but uh, I finally got it, and it uh, holds pride of place in the um, whole Vision uh, collection. Most of Vision boosters were like these ones here on the outside edges with just the two-knob capacitor-tuned simple uh, boosters. Then they got fancy, and the TVZ has this rotating dial a little, uh, little window. And then the commander, they really got fancy. But they uh, didn't really solve the problem again of you know, nonlinear tuning. Because all the channels above seven is this last little section of the dial. Mm -hmm. 
So several manufacturers chose a slide rule type dials for their products. The standard coil model B50 has a quite an unusual tuning mechanism that I haven't figured out yet. Uh, it's one of the other in the list of tuning types. Seems to be both capacitive and inductive change at the same time. It is, however, quite evenly spaced between all of the, uh, the channels. Unusual. The Oak 100 has a rare Q multiplier bandwidth control. Never seen that on anything else. It was, they claim it to be a three stage booster with a, a set of triodes. Um, I haven't tracked out the circuit yet to see if they uh, are just blowing smoke or if they actually met three, uh, three booster uh, sections in series. The, uh, oh, the cabinet for this thing is a True Tone D1019 radio cabinet. And the Turner TV1, Turner was uh, is the microphone people, another audio related outfit. It had used an induct tuner and a 12AT7 in their booster with a rather funky plastic case that uh, isn't smooth and isn't exactly rough. Don't know what to call it. A few booster makers chose large circular dials as a design element. The national company crammed a bulky click stop assembly and a 6AK5 into their nicely rounded metal cabinet. Radiart, a maker of uh, vibrators for car radios, and Regency created very different style cabinets, but the circuit inside is essentially identical. Basically, just a permeability tuned 6J6. The position of the two knobs seems to be very consistent in that type of booster. Now, see if you can spot the similarities in these two pairs. It's a trick question. On the left, the Regency DB410 and the RMS SP6J both have a 6J6 and permeability tuning. Over here on the right, the Telekit and the standard B51 are click stop types with 6AK5. Interestingly enough, the Telekit is not a kit, never was. The, uh, the company, Electrotechnical Industries, uh, started off in 1947 making television receiver kits and the name sort of stuck. The standard, I like this one a lot. A very unusual shape, beautiful Bakelite cabinet. It, chassis is upside down inside, and it uses uh, printed circuits, which is one of the first uh, that I believe that uh, uh, did that about in 1951 or 52. The Regency DB410 is one of the classic and often seen early boosters. Very simple, very reliable. The RMS, RMS stands for Radio Merchandise Sales, also made a model SP6. It's entirely different. It's the same cabinet, but a different face, and it used a 6AK5 tube instead of a 6J6 that's in the uh, SP6J. Never seen anybody else do something like that. In June of 1953, though, the freeze finally ended, and the number of VHF stations on the air doubled in a year. With more stations and close range of viewers, the need for boosters declined since more people had strong signals. In an historic move, the FCC authorized 70 new channels in the UHF band. That added an additional 100 plus stations. We leap right here. But almost no TV set 
could tune those UHF stations. Inverters were needed. The need for converters, of course, hadn't been anticipated since UHF television tests had been conducted since the late 1940s. Here is a truly prehistoric converter. RCA made 16 of these Model B converters for their UHF field tests in Washington, D.C. Had just two 6J6 tubes wrapped in lead, which could tune only up to channel 35, which is about 600 megahertz. This one is in the Early Television Foundation Museum in Ohio. There was also a Model A that had four tubes and could tune up to channel 70, 800 megahertz. During the freeze, several electronics companies anticipated the use of UHF for television and developed their own converters. These two units reveal their early origins with dials calibrated in frequency rather than channel numbers. The Dumont's evidently a prototype. It uses an acorn tube for its oscillator and two output amplifier stages. The General Electric UHF-101 was well-developed following its announcement in 1951, but apparently it never saw volume production. After I got mine, I was surprised to find that there was another collector who had one. And neither of us have ever seen any other ones at all. And there was never any advertising that we found for uh, this model. This is the inside of that Dumont. The oscillator assembly with the 6F4 acorn tube is over here on the left. And the input tuning is on the right. They're connected by a short length of surgical tubing. Each cylinder is machined out of clear plastic, apparently as part of a modified butterfly tuning circuit. The two tubes here on the chassis are the output amplifiers. I call this a model 2151 because that's the only other identification on the whole thing, but not I'm sort of proud of it because how many people have a prototype you know, that never was supposed to have left the lab? And uh, you know, you can, it's a really interesting marker for uh, progress in the technology in the early, uh, early days of UHF. Uh, as far as I know, Dumont never marketed any uh, converters at all, but they did make some for their TV uh, internal for their uh, only te their televisions. So they may have used this same assembly you know, in uh, some of those early sets. I think up to 35% of television sets in 1953 were made with UHF capability built in. And the next year it fell to less than half of that and after that, nobody bothered, <laughs> at least not for a long time. A few companies combine both VHF booster and UHF converter functions in one cabinet. Under the new FCC channel assignments, some communities were UHF only markets, but in the fringe areas of other VF VHF stations. So these combination units serve that kind of market. You notice that they, the static, for example, here, the, this is the UHF dial, and this is the VHF booster dial. And of course, the control for selections. Over on the, for the Setco, which was made in Kentucky, um, same thing. Here's the UHF dial, here's the VHF dial, and the switch control on the metal. You can almost imagine they're Exactly the same, completely different inside. The set code is very simple, not, uh, not very complicated at all. The aesthetic used their top of the line booster and a brand new design for the uh, converter. And the converter fed into the booster, so it had a lot of gain.
So as with boosters, UHF converters market matured rapidly. It settled on a few variations on a basic circuit, much like the All-American 5 AM radios. In this case, it was a 6 AF4 triode oscillator, a crystal diode mixer, and sometimes an IF output amplifier, all on channel 4, 5, or 6. Because that's the, you know, the purpose of a booster. That's its job. Convert UHF television signals at 470 to 890 megahertz into something a TV set could see, usually on channel 4, 5, or 6. Input tuning section or pre-selector was providing a, a little more selectivity at the front end, but it's also very important that it kept the local oscillator signal from leaking back out of the cabinet. The FCC came down pretty hard on the early uh, UHF converter makers for having uh, an awful lot of incidental radiation from that uh, local oscillator. So the uh, many sets had two stages of input tuning. Uh, diode, a semiconductor diode, was usually almost, you know, pretty much always used for the mixer. It had a loss, of course, in, in the mixing process, but it was much quieter than any tube that uh, could be afforded in a, um, in a product uh, like this. So it was the, the choice pretty much for the uh, entire life of uh, tube type converters. The IF amplifier is usually either a 6CB6 pentode or a 6BK7 or 12AT7 uh, double triode. Uh, which was then connected uh, usually as a cast code. Output filter was just a broadband filter, keep you know, again, to keep things from leaking out of the chassis. This is a handsome devil, isn't it? This is the Mallory TV 101. It's probably the most successful of the first wave of tube type converters. It was rebranded by at least a dozen other companies. And at one point, Mallory made several thousand a day. TV 101s still show up regularly in flea markets and antique stores. I call it the queen of early UHF converters. Blonder Tongue was and continues to be an extremely successful and prolific manufacturer of television products. I found about two dozen models of Blonder Tongue home converters produced over approximately 25 years. This is their, <clears throat> excuse me, this is their first home converter, the BTU-2. It was introduced in early 1953. That $39.95 list price was probably about mid-range for the early uh, collection of the uh, UHF converters. These are the principal four cabinet designs over the run of the BTU-2 series. That three-knob front face was a giveaway for that whole BTU-2 series. There was also a cheaper Model 99 converter that used the same cabinet but had no fine-tuning knob and also no output tube, no IF output. Notice the styling difference between 1953 and 1963. A dark painted metal cabinet versus a nice light colored, lightweight plastic cabinet with a uh, uh, more sprightly, how we say, styling. The middle years used Bakelite, and that cabinet lasted a very long time. <laughs> Interesting, the chassis did not change hardly at all. You can see the difference between the 1953 and the 1963 chassis. You'd be hard pressed to find any difference visually. There were, of course, small uh, improvements in the components and they changed the cabinets around them. But uh, 10 years is a pretty rare run for a single chassis.
This stylish RC600 Regency converter is a very large unit with an elegant but rather expensive tuning mechanism. Note that the price of $49.95 and compare that with $150 to $200, $250 cost of a tabletop TV in 1954. Pretty expensive accessory. Regency, by the way, was the same company that made the first production transistor radio, the TR1, and about the same time. They were busy. Granco is probably better known for its FM tuners and receivers, but they were all in on UHF converters. With six or seven models produced between 1953 and 1955, they were one of the most prolific of the first wave of UHF converter makers. This little UHF UH2 down here is much smaller than the others. It still has the same number of tubes as uh, the other models. Uh, they just managed to cram it into a tiny space. Its predecessor was designed in a metal cabinet, but otherwise looked the same to be mounted behind TV, uh, TV sets with only just this portion sticking up, uh, like Kilroy on the back of your TV set. We we're trying to hide the converter and make it unobtrusive, and it made it really small. I believe I've seen the same plastic case model with an RCA label, and I think a Gerald label as well. But after 1954, the UHF boom stalled. The number of UHF stations on the air actually declined for many years. Station numbers didn't really recover until the All Channel Receiver Act took effect in 1964. That law required all new TVs to tune the UHF channels. Most of the early converter makers had died or dropped out during these lean period. But in the early 60s, new technologies such as the new Vista tubes and semiconductors began to revive the converter business. Gavin Instruments was formed by a former Blonder Tongue sales manager. In 1963, they introduced their G-series converters, which used the then new RCA new Vista tubes. The rounded ends of the cabinet was a departure from usual rectangular box shape. And it's what really caught my eye the first time I saw it. The whole G series, not the whole G series, has this rounded uh, ends, but they made several of them uh, with uh, new Vista tubes, either one or two, in the same unusual cabinet type with the nice brushed gold finish. But, uh, I think it's unique. I don't think there are any other UHF converter types made that had a cabinet like that. I've seen some trapezoids, but nothing in this shape. Nothing else in this shape. <clears throat> a longtime tuner manufacturer, Standard Coil, adopted the name of Standard Colesman when they began making UHF converters in the early 60s. This very stylish and low-slung model TA is their all-transistor version. It was produced in 1965. Its predecessor, the model A, looked identical, but used tubes. Semiconductors allowed for a much smaller and lighter converter. This Gerald is one of the smallest. The active element is a tunnel diode which is almost a forgotten device now. The battery was said to last a year, made in about 1965. The face on this is only about the size of a credit card. Sometimes semiconductors allowed simplification to be taken to an extreme. Johnson, not EF Johnson, the ham radio company, made a few modest tube and transistor converters, but this one is about as simple as possible. The oscillator, transistor, and mixer diode here 
are just suspended on their leads above the tuning unit. That tuning device, if you look closely, is a rotary switch with the detents removed. The common rotating element and the wiper form a tuned line at UHF. There's no input tuning or output filtering, and the power supply is just a diode, resistor, and a capacitor connected to the AC power line. But it works. And I guess the FCC wasn't watching as closely as they were back in the 50s. One of the favorites in my collection is this 1965 Channel Master Model 4003 Convertenna. It combines a transistor UHF converter, a UHF bow tie antenna, and rabbit ears. Pretty much the complete TV accessory. Unfortunately, by this time, the All Channel Receiver Act had signaled the end of the need for separate UHF converters. New UHF equipped televisions pushed external converters aside, although they did hang on longer than many expected. The last UHF converter ad I found was in 1979, thus closing the era of set top boosters and converters. So, I hope you've gotten a clearer picture of this mostly forgotten history of TV boxes. I'll close with a photo of another small part of my collection of TV boxes. My wife says it looks like the first slide, but these are mostly UHF converters. The first slide was boosters. This is the building I personally built for my collection about 15 years ago at our Massachusetts home. But the collection has grown quite a bit since then. I've almost finished a much larger building in the backyard of my current home to hold my whole collection as a TV boxes museum. I do, after all, have the world's largest collection of boosters and converters. Why not a museum in my backyard? Talk to me about a tour. It'll open later this spring. Our website, tvboxes.com, has photos and, and more information about many of the items in my collection. <laughs>